Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Michelle Cobb, the publisher of Audiophile Magazine, and it's my job and pleasure to welcome you here today. Audiophile is the number one source for audiobook reviews in the world, and we get to have these very cool conversations with fantastic voice talent. So today we are going to be having a mysterious conversation with diverse perspectives. Let me introduce our guests, but also let me remind you, if you have a question, we will be taking some of those. Be sure to put your question in the Q&A box, not the chat box. All right, let's see who we have here with us today. It's not a mystery. <laughs> oh, and let me first say thank you to Dreamscape for being a fantastic sponsor and supporter of everything that we are doing. They brought all of the narrators here today. All right, we're going to kick off with Janina Edwards, who is a graduate of NYU's Tisch School, and she started her audiobook career in the 1980s for AFB's Talking Books program. She excels at portraying believable characters and voices of African Americans and other English speaking African dis diaspora. I knew I was going to struggle with that word. She has recorded over 400 titles, and her audiobooks have garnered seven Audi finalist nominations, eight Earphones Award, and two Sovas nominations. And this year, the final revival of Opal and Neb, an audiophile Earphones winner, also won the Audi in the Best Fiction category. Congratulations. Next up, we have Tanya Eby, who is a narrator of more than a thousand audiobooks. But wait, she does other things too. She is the author of the Man Hands Romantic Comedy Series. She's written and produced audiobook short stories for Blender Woman Productions, her imprint. And she excels at narrating both fiction and nonfiction. And recently, her performance of Rebecca Solnit's treatise on feminism, The Mother of All Questions, got an earphones award. So the stamp of approval from Audiophile Magazine. And just in case you didn't know this, she was a contestant on Netflix's show Nailed It, which is a baking show. And she won first prize because uh, her cake was so bad. So that's a special kill, skill right there. <laughs> Next up, we have Frankie Corzo, who was born and raised in New Jersey to Cuban immigrant parents. And she spent her childhood acting and studying at Montclair State University. She's also an earphones winner. I think there's a theme here today and has titles on Audible and Audiophile's best of the year lists and has since 2017. They include Mexican Gothic and she narrated the Newbery Medal winning title, The Last Quenis, Quen, I knew I was gonna struggle with this one, Quentista. All right, close. Probably not perfect, but we'll get her to say it. Um, she's been on Amazon's The Terminal List, Stars Gaslight, Fox's Pivoting, and Netflix's seri series Selena, and elsewhere on your TV. So look out for her. And then bringing us a little something different to the table with some testosterone, we have... Pete Cross, who is an active narrator and producer for Dreamscape Media. And I have to say, Pete looks a little bit different in his photos. He's rocking the, uh, the facial hair, hair hard right now. And uh, he has narrated his share of audiobook titles, including Audi finalists and the Audi winning title, Be Dazzled. Plus, he participated with Audiophile Sync Summer Programming with his performance of Openly Straight being featured. And his performance of the week was recently featured on the Behind the Mic podcast. So we know all of these people and we love them and you're going to get to know them soon. All right. I will remind you that this is going to replay on our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash C for custom slash audiophile magazine. And that's audiophile with an F, of course. And I will remind you that we have two podcasts. If you like a daily review, you're going to want to check out the Behind the Mic podcast. Every weekday, we bring you a review of an audiobook. And then we have Audiophile's Audiobook Break podcast. This serializes an audiobook. In September, we have the Japanese Civil Liberties Collection coming from our friends at LA Theatre Works. And then in October, we have Dracula coming uh, from our friends at Dreamscape. All right, enough of me. Let's get to the meat and potatoes here. I am going to kick things off with Janina reading to us from Murder Out of Character by Olivia Matthews. All right, Janina, the floor is yours. 
unmuting is a helpful thing for this. Um, all right. Malkovich Savings and Loan CFO found dead. Shock loosened my grip on the spoon and knocked the breath from my lungs. I was just getting to know Nell. I liked and admired her. She was smart, enthusiastic, and driven. Her laughter was infectious, even when I didn't get the joke. Oh, Phoenix, I'm going to miss her. He leaped onto the table as though curious to read what I was talking about. With a heavy heart, I pushed aside my breakfast and read the news story. Deputies Jedediah Watley and Errol Cole were assigned to Nell Kinton's case. Jedediah and Errol also were investigating Hank Figgs' death. The article didn't state whether the deputies suspected a connection between the two tragedies, which made my questions feel more urgent. What if anything about the cases were similar? And what if anything about the deaths was suspicious? My thoughts abruptly stopped as I remembered our kickoff three nights ago. The last time I'd spoken with Nell. In my mind's eye, I saw again the sheet of note paper on which four names had been written, Hank Fig, Nell Kenton, Brittany Wilson, and Spencer Holt. The same icy hand that had touched me when I'd found the list retraced my spine. Focus. I pushed away from the table and, placed the length of, and paced the length of my modest dining room. The oak flooring was warm beneath my bare feet. Sunlight streamed through the open cream Venetian blinds over each of the room's three windows and from the rear French doors in the adjoining foyer. Could it be a coincidence that Hank and Nell's names were on that list and now they're dead? You know I don't believe in coincidences. You know I don't believe in coincidences. Phoenix stretched out on top of the crier, which lay open on the table. He tracked my progress across the room, his vivid green eyes wide. Was he really listening or was he just humoring me? He did that sometimes. And Lovely. And I will remind people, if you have a question for Janina, put it in the Q&A box. All right, Janina, we're going to start the, the questions with you. So this was a cozy mystery. And cozy mysteries often have a different tone than thrillers or suspense. So do you have a different approach when you are narrating a cozy mystery versus when you narrate something with a, a bit more blood and guts? Yeah, you know, and I saw that you sent the questions ahead of time. I was like, oh, this is a cozy mystery. Um, and, and, you know, in part, I'm like, that's a marketing thing, I, I think, to some degree. I think that, um, but then I thought about it and I was like, well, with a cozy mystery, I think that they are literally more cozy. I mean, we're talking about murder here, <laughs> which, mm -hmm. which um, I read an article some years ago where they were like, you know, this is really weird that we make this kind of entertainment out of murder, right? Um, and we have TV shows, everybody get, dies, and it kind of desensitizes us on one level. But what makes it cozy is, I mean, she, in this scene, this woman is a librarian. She lives with her cat. You know, she's, she's friendly with everybody in town, this small town, this um, fantasy or whatever, fictional town in, in Georgia. Um, but she solves these murders. Um, and, but she's got a cat. She's a librarian. It's all her friends. And so it's, it's, that's, I think, what makes it cozy. It takes this really bad thing murder but we've got this context of i'm solving murders but with my friends that's kind of weird um I, I don't know there's something about that but in terms of how i approach it i i think no i i don't think i i don't think i actually approach it any more differently um i'm still figuring out who these characters are um finding some connection vocally and or you know, in my head to relate to and share that with you as the listener. Um, and I think that as a narrator of a mystery, you're using a very, sometimes, sometimes more obvious, but usually pretty subtle guidance. You are the oral version of a director of a movie where you're directing that listener's attention to certain things. Um, one of the characters, that list of people that she mentions that she saw on this list, one of them is her, her, 
her love interest that, you know, they won't admit they really love each other, blah, 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 but he's her love interest. So the fact that his name is on that list and it's last is a big deal. So it's like your, my job is to subtly point out, hey, you might want to pay attention to this. But also, since I've read it beforehand, know when to like not be too obvious because yes, it's important to know, but I don't want to give it, give away whatever. Um, so I think that's my job in any mystery um, is like that subtle hand to like, hey, listen to that. Oh, wait. Maybe this, you know, I don't know. that's my theory. I, th I think that's a good theory. Mm -hmm. And we've got some great questions coming in. So I'm going to lob these over to a uh, few of your friends here. Tanya, how do you develop characters and accents for characters if the author is not providing those in the text, if they don't say, he said with a Boston accent, for instance? Well, I never add accents um, unless it's specifically given in the text. So I never do that uh, because you can get into so much trouble. Um, and I have gotten into some serious trouble with that previously before I learned this lesson um, where I, I gave an accent, a Southern accent, and I hadn't read the book, which is a big no-no too. And then on page 340, this character hated Southern accents, hated people who were Southerners. <laughs> and I had given her a Southern accent. Anyway, so... Um, develop characters, it really is in the text. You can kind of get a feel for the personality. Um, you don't have to know exactly how they say something, but how they're talking to someone, how their relationships are with other characters gives you lots and lots of clues on how to give them a, a vocalization that fits their personality. So I'm curious what happened with that book, though. Did you have to re-record that particular yes. part? Wow. Yes. Yes. Um, and now I prep all my books. It was a weird circumstance, I promise, where we were under the gun. It was a, a really fast book. Um, we didn't, we just had to get it. And yeah, I learned that lesson really well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Pete, I'll ask you, you know, uh, we have an example of what not to do, which is don't not read the book. So um, do you always read the book and particularly with a mystery? Do you read the end so you you know how it ends? Like, do I skip to the end and read that first? Well, that no. I mean, I, I agree. No, I, yeah. But yes, I I always yes, I always. I mean, there are times when you don't have the time to give it as thorough a reading as you would like. But yeah, if given enough time, I absolutely read it at least once and do all the prep and uh, I would not skip to the end of any book to see how it turns out first because I want to remember what it was like to be finding mm -hmm. things out and experiencing those things as I went but then like Janina said it, it's it, once you know everything, then it is you do kind of guide and and like that. Yeah, pay attention to this. Pay attention to this person. And um, yeah, yeah. So Frankie, you know, we've talked a little bit about the prep here. You know, do you identify and decide on different voices for different characters in a particular way? Like, you know, most of these you're recording from an iPad. Do you mark them in some way? Um, yeah, I do. I used to mark them again, like everybody is saying, depending on time. Um, sometimes you don't have time to go through and do all the steps, but um, marking, especially when I was getting to the swing of Mary, it was very important to me. And I tend to like highlight and annotate the same way it would any other script. Um, and yeah, I use Tanya's method as well. Of, like I decide beforehand insofar as like you get to know these characters authors go through painstaking amounts of time mm -hmm. deciding all these little you know quirks and detail for everyone involved in the story and I feel like you get to know them so like as I'm recording I also mark off like okay what was the voice so that mm -hmm. I can go back to it but I usually find that when I'm in the process of recording you get so in the world and it is so informed by the book that I don't actually need to go back I just get to jump right into each character as I go through, unless it's like a sci-fi with a hundred characters and I'm only human. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a great question really for all of you. So I'll start with you, Janita. 
Are there books you automatically say yes or no to narrating and why? <laughs> yeah, there are actually. I mean, this author, um, I, I like her books. I mean, they're fun. <laughs> well, why not? You know, they're, um, so yeah, she's one that um, if they said, hey, we've got Olivia Matthews, I'd go, sure, because they're fun. And I'm, I do this work because I enjoy books and reading it. And, and I want to know what happens next too. <laughs> so I'm like, wait, wait. in fact, I got another uh, Naima Simone is in the romance vein that, and I like her words on uh, her words, well, her words, but her books. And um, they, you know, like, hey, would you like to do this one? I was like, sure. I, I was aware that this, the series was continuing. I wanted to, there's been this one character that is kind of mean that you're like, what's going on with her? And I, I want, I want to know too, what's happening with her, but I like the writing. Um, there's, um, I mean, Olivia Matthews does not, uh, these are mysteries that don't have a, they're not, they're not romantic. I mean, they're romantic, they're romantic, perhaps more traditional. There's no sex is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> they're clean. Um, yeah, right. In the romance vein, you know, I, I my standards have risen. I, I have no problem with people having sex in the books, but I, but some stuff gets really old for me. So I'm like, yeah, I, I actually don't need to do this particular type of book anymore. So I'm much more selective about when I choose to do that. But yeah, they're definitely authors that I, I just enjoy their work. Um, as a, as a reader, um, and I want to know what happens next. And so, um, yeah, and they're also, you know, as a narrator, I, I hope this is something y'all do. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's mine. You know, that, that's my book. What do you mean you're going to offer to some other narrator? Uh -uh. That belongs to me, aside from the paycheck, you know, like that, that's, that's my series. I want to do that. Mm -hmm. And I like being associated with it. So for all of those reasons, yes, they're definitely uh, writers I want. Excellent. Glad to hear you're taking ownership. Yeah. So Pete, what do you, what about you? Do you have any yes, no, you know, triggers that we should know about? I will not do anything that promotes a particularly uh, right-leaning agenda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anything. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky. There are those books that kind of sneak in and you don't know mm -hmm. that they are, that they may be uh, politically uh, offensive to you. But I've been pretty good at avoiding those. And I think it be, being at things like this and saying, yeah, I'm not going to do that uh, has helped people uh, understand not to offer me those in the first place. But um uh, but uh, things that I will take, absolutely things that um, that I'm very passionate about would be especially like young adult, um, uh, queer themed, um, positive sorts of things, which I've had the great fortune to do uh, recently um, Fantastic. For, uh, for another publisher that I will not mention because I'm at Dreamscape currently. <laughs> <laughs> Frankie, what about you? Yes, no triggers? Um, definitely nothing right leaning. I've thankfully, um, I think I've done enough very obviously not right leaning stuff, like nonfiction stuff that it doesn't really come my way. So I haven't stumbled upon that, which is good. Um, and nothing like uh, violent when it comes to romance. I've had to. Mm -hmm. You know, I think like Janina, I still consider myself a newbie and I'm honored to actually be here and kind of confused by it. But um, <laughs> in that, I've also had to um, kind of protect myself. I, narrating is so intimate to me. You're just in this box with these words and it you're alone. It can be very triggering. So you have to be careful, I feel like, of what you feel comfortable with doing. So I don't do anything that's like sexually violent or promotes any sort of violence towards women. And if it's, you know, something people are into, that's for them, but it's not for me. I'm sorry, my dog is trying to say hello to everyone and she's <laughs> refusing to leave me alone. Um, it's Zoom, we're supposed to have dogs and babies and yeah, okay, all you. sorts of things. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, and my yes is, again, anything like Pete said, empowering, um, in the YA, anything in the queer space, anything um, Latinx related that I feel like I can make a difference. You know, I just did 
this really awesome guide for little girls of like, um, one was called Tough Stuff and one was called, one was about body image. So when I have like time that I can do stuff like that, it always feels really good. And then I've been lucky to work with some authors that I've gotten to work with, not only in series, but just in multiple one-off titles that um, have not only made my career, but they've become rich friendships and I love their writing and it feels like a fun collaboration every time. And um, I love talking to them about their like vision and it, you know, it's a fun little, I don't know, it's really cool to keep being able to keep working with the same people like that. That's fantastic. Yeah. All right, Tanya, your quick yes, no's, and then, then we get to hear from you. Uh, yeah, quick yes, no's. Um, I've recorded uh, over a thousand books, so I don't say no very much. And that's really because to me, every book is a gift. And honestly, I know it's cheesy, but I find something in each book, even if it's far from my perspective, uh, that I can play with. I have said no to some things where I just felt like I wasn't the right voice, that I didn't have the skill set. Um, but in general, uh, it's a book. I'm, I love it. Give it to me. Excellent. That's well, it. we're going to turn things over to you to read from okay. Magic Lies and Deadly Pies by Misha Pop. But we had a question, and I okay. think this will help to set up the reading. So what our listener is saying is you've made the main character so appealing. Uh -huh. How did you manage that, considering she's a vigilante witch serial killer? Yeah, well, I... I mean, I think it's in the writing. Um, the writing is very humorous. And to go against that, to be gritty, or it just didn't, it's kind of, sometimes it's like music, right? You want to find the harmony, you want to find the right notes. So I just read the notes. Awesome. All right. Well, let's put you up here and hear a little bit of these fantastic notes from you. All right. And I've got a dog who wants to join me too. So here we go. Um, he eats like he's starving, but three quarters of the way through the small pie, he starts to slow. The pie coma is real. He drops into a chair at the table and stabs another bite, but it's like I have to finish it. I'm glad you like it, I say, and some part of me even means it. At its core, baking pie is about making people happy. The world can be going to complete shit, but a freshly baked pie is a reprieve, however slight even these pies. I'm going to need to nap for like a week, he says. I thought sugar was supposed to make you hyper. I feel like I could die, but in a good way. Do you have a store or something where I can get more of these? His words are slow and slurring, and I know it's almost time. I say, this was one of a kind. You can make a fortune on that, he nods drunkenly. A fortune? That's the irony of these pies. The ends are usually, although not always, like this. Peaceful and happy and satiated, the very opposite of what is deserved. Would you like to go lie down? I ask. Mm-hmm. I take his arm and guide him up from the table. He leans into me, mumbling incoherently as I guide him to the living room. I don't like leaving them in kitchens. Dining rooms are okay, beds and bathrooms too, but kitchens are sacred even the gross ones. He collapses onto the sofa like a felled tree. His breathing is shallow now, but he is content. I kneel down beside him. He doesn't deserve content. Kevin, I say, Kevin, try to look at me. His eyes flutter open, find mine. That's it. Pay attention. Your heartbeat is slowing down now. That's from the pie. His face contorts in fear, but I hold a hand up. No, shh, there's nothing you can do. Just relax into it. But the pie, Kevin, you weren't a random winner. This is important. It was a special pie just for you, courtesy of Anna Hargrave. That's it. <laughs> I love it. Of course, I'm a huge pie it. fan. So, <laughs> you know, these these mysteries are right up my alley. So you, you know, too, yeah. we know she's a serial killer, killing via pie yeah. in this case. What do you enjoy about narrating her particular point of view? I mean, I love, I mean, I'm also, I just happen to be someone who loves to cook. 
Um, so I could connect with her on that. Um, she's uh, very, a very sweet and kind person. And the reason why she's killing people is for a very feminist objective, which I also uh, could respond to. She doesn't really want to be doing it, but Misha Pop is really wonderful in creating this world with a lot of wonderful rules that the character has to play by, which makes it easier for the listener, the reader to connect with her and accept that she's a, a murderer. So the mystery in this book isn't actually about her killing people. We know that from the very beginning. There's another mystery layered on in and throughout the book, which is really fun. You can make a mystery out of everything. That's what I've learned you from can. reading many, many thrillers. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, Frankie, I'm curious if you can tell us about one of the sort of favorite unusual characters that you've brought to life in a mystery. Ooh. Favorite? I mean, I do love the character from this book. Um, and not that she's unusual, just kind of in the same vein, I think it's unusual to see the like mother kind of affluent part of her community um, person taking on the role of getting kind of gritty into this murder. And like, you know, like kind of like Janina was saying, it's not like it's, she's not a murderer, she's not getting gritty into it, but she's discovering parts of herself, which I guess will lead us into <laughs> what I find fun about this character in this book is, you know, she's discovering parts of herself through having to pursue this situation she's stumbled upon. Um, so I think that's fun. Well, I think that, you know, you've, you've kind of set us up to hear from Mango Mambo <laughs> and murder. So yeah. perhaps we should, we'll take some more questions after you've done that reading, since you did such a great setup. Let's, let's go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Okay. Basta, Alma. I told you I'm not doing the show. I accentuated each word with the knife I held in my hand before I stabbed the packing tape and sliced open box number five, of 48. You are perfect for it. And come on, Miriam, what else are you doing? I narrowed my eyes and glared at my best friend, Alma. ¿Qué es esto? I waved my hand like a hostess showing off. I waved my hand like a hostess showing someone to their table. Is this house going to unpack itself? Porfa, this is not going to take all week. The cooking spot is next Friday. Today is Tuesday. You have a week and a half. It's a short cooking demo on a morning show. Alma shook her pinched hand like a stereotypical Italian grandmother. Except, of course, she wasn't Italian, and neither was I. We're Cuban-American. Both cultures talked with their hands. Or, in my case, whatever was in my hands at the moment. I crumpled the New York Post page that wrapped a chipped green dinner plate before placing it on the stack that was building in the cupboard of my new Florida home. I shook the plate like a tambourine. But I don't cook. You do cook. Your cooking is excellent. Alma, dressed in a sleeveless white dress, stepped away from the mound of newsprint about to tumble off the quartz, about to tumble off the quartz countertop. This is the most expensive kitchen I'd ever had the luck to possess. The biggest, too. I am not a celebrity chef. I'm an academic. Find me a job at a university. Do you want to work work or work parent? I thought you said you were taking a little time off to be a full-time mom. Roberto wants me to stay home for a year, at least until Manny is ready for school. That makes the Un Mundo morning show super for you. You need to do it. La Tacita is perfect for you. One morning a week and you get a paycheck. Alma raised her shoulders to her ears and flicked her palms out in a voila but I'm a chef. I'm a food anthropologist. I felt heat built, but I'm not a chef. I'm a food anthropologist. I felt heat building in my chest. So I liked how in that you were actually using your hands. So <laughs> <laughs> Very rare. I don't as also a Cuban American. <laughs> okay. So how do protagonists like Miriam and her friends, um, expand your work in mysteries in terms of you know setting voice and perspectives um you know i always think that the specific is kind of universal and i love so i love that the more specificity we find in a world 
the more we get to see things that say, oh, I do that too, and bring in different kinds of readers and people into um, discovering different cultures and stuff. So I think it was really fun for this, especially the Cuban diaspora in Miami is so specific. Um, and I grew up in the same version of that in New Jersey. So this one in particular was really fun just because there was so much um, specificity that I recognized from my own world and seeing that kind of infused into the world of a cozy mystery and how those little um, like touchstones kind of inform the crime that has occurred was really fun. It, I think really it creates a really rich environment to play with and to bring characters to life in a deeper way. What about you, Janina? Any favorite characters that you're getting to play that you think of from the mystery realm besides our cat librarian that you've booked? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I'm fond of, I mean, I don't, I guess what the uh, other, uh, all of us have said, I don't, I don't do books. I don't like I generally, I mean, there might be one or two that sneak in there, but I generally try to make sure that, it, you know, why, why, why do this if, if I'm not liking this? Um, but I, I'm definitely enjoying um, Olivia Matthews uh, books. I was, when you asked the last question, I was like, I don't remember my book. So I went to my Google spreadsheet <laughs> to look at my books. I was like, what are their mysteries? Um, and they're, um, one that stood out, um, which was is the long, long afternoon, which which is not a dreamscape book. I'm sorry, um, but uh, it was okay. really interesting. It was by a it was a black woman. I think it was like in the 50s, and she was a maid, um, and she she someone dies in the house she's a maid for, and given the times and the situation, they kind of assume that she somehow had something to do with it. And the author was actually German. So it was, just, it was really interesting kind of outsider view of you know, our racial climate in that time period. But I thought the character, the main character was really interesting, whatever. So anyway, um, I don't remember her name right now, the character's name right now, but it was a really interesting um, book. But yeah, I, I, I you know, I, I, it's like, it's, I don't know, this is what came to mind. It's like pie. It's like you're eating, you know, uh, key lime pie this week. And it's like, this is really good pie. <laughs> and then next week I'm eating whatever pie. It's like, this is really good pie. You know, I, I want to fall in love with every book I'm doing, ideally. Well, that's, that's lovely. And now, of course, I'm back to thinking about pie. All right. <laughs> um, we had a lot of questions, actually, um, Pete. And I'll ask you this because you are a producer as well. You know, when you're in a series, how do you keep things straight from book to book? It may be a year or two years or three years in between. You know, how do you return to those characters and make the voices similar? Uh, I mean, uh, mm, accessing audio files, obviously, <laughs> saving everything. Um, notes, notes, notes. And what I will often do when I'm either casting or uh, more often when I'm narrating, I will, I'll, I'll cast it, it as though I'm casting a film. I'll cast it in my head. And so I know, you know, I'm not trying to, um, kitty, I'm not trying to uh, impersonate any particular actor, but I, I know the sort of general feel, the general tone of of who that is. And sometimes that happens before I'm really, before I really mentally think it, this Devil's Chew Toy, there's a character in it who, uh, I mean, I had a rough idea of who she was, and then suddenly she kind of morphed into Eileen Brennan, who played <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Peacock in um, uh, uh, Clue? It, it became that that a bit of that character. Um, so those, the, I think that's how I remember it. Or people in my life, um, yeah. Well, that's uh, that's interesting. We hear a lot about narrators. Sort of, I always wonder when I'm speaking with the narrator now, are they? gathering a bit of me to take into a character right. because I do feel like people are pulling so much from their personal experiences and the people that they know. Um, in addition to the people that you know, Pete, you know, in what ways do personal experiences actually influence those characters? 
Oh, uh, uh, immensely, I think. Um, I, I just did one. Um, actually, the, the, the one that I'm going to refer to, also not a dreamscape title. Oops. Um, you're, you're allowed to record for yes, other I publishers know. that speak of I them as know, well. I know, and they, the, dreamscape is very supportive of that. Um, uh, the Honeys by Ryan LaSala that I did for Scholastic um, is a it's an amazing book and I was really happy to work with him again and um I think that though I drew more on conversations I had with Ryan and his experiences uh losing his sister um the main character who is gender fluid um loses his sister in a very traumatic way and the mystery of that is just him trying to dig into it and find out who she was and and you know obviously what happened that led to her death and so I had him in my head a lot um another book I just did another one for Scholastic uh which was not a mystery but but a young adult queer themed book that really took me back to being roughly that age uh the age of the main character in the 90s early 90s and so that one i i felt super close to and there were absolutely people it's like yeah, that's a young me and that's that friend i had you know when i was when i was that age um yeah great well i'm going to we've got some great questions in the, the q and a box but I'd love for you to read for us first from Devil's Chew Toy by Rob sure. Osler, Pete, and then yeah. we'll deal with some of these great questions. Sure. Camillo fired up the engine, switched on the stereo, and started singing along to a twangy male voice spilling from the speakers. The easiest thing for me is falling hard for you. Camillo's dancing talent and looks hadn't prepared me for his lack of vocal ability. The guy was a horrible singer. He wasn't just flat. He was so far off hitting the notes that I thought he was screwing around. But his genuine enthusiasm told the truth. He was utterly tone deaf. I twisted my grimace into a smile just as he looked over at me. You like this song? He asked. Stanley Kellogg. His new album's dope. Sorry, I don't follow country. No? Like, not at all? Pretty much, yeah. What do you listen to then? Podcasts, mostly? As soon as the words left my lips, I wanted to reel them back. I wanted Camillo to like me, and so far, I knew he was an amazing dancer, and that nothing on his likes list, red, high tops, trucks, and country music, suggested podcast enthusiast right those can be cool i guess his tone was less than convincing i shuffled topics in my head hunting for possible common interests before i could shift the conversation he said so like what sort of podcasts deciding to be vague in the hope he'd lose interest i said oh you know NPR programs, that sort of thing. NPR? Oh, right. National Pro Rodeo. Camilla looked over, his eyes bright with delight. I wouldn't have guessed you were into that. My mind raced. The last thing I wanted was to blow the moment, and I most definitely didn't want Camillo to feel stupid, but really, what could I say? Camillo erupted into laughter. Oh my God, Hayden. If you could see your face, I'm just messing with you, man. I know what NPR is. He produced a gigantic grin. I may dance on a pool table and drive a truck, but that doesn't mean I'm a clueless hick. Busted. Um, sorry. I didn't mean seriously. No worries, man. I lured you into that one. Nice. I love how you balance the, you know, the humor and the seriousness. How do you, you know, find that balance and how do you work to get that 
correct tone because there's a lot going on there. I think you just don't play the humor. You just don't play the laughs. It's it, it's in the writing um, and you're true to the situation. Otherwise, especially in things like this, uh, that is a mystery and that becomes very serious and deals with some serious issues. Uh, you know, the humor falls flat um, and it's, it's, or it's jarring. It's too jarring to go from something humorous to then this really super serious thing. So yeah, I think if, it, especially if it's good writing, it's just in there and you trust it and you, you play it true to the situation and the and the characters. And I hear, you know, the cast of you saying over and over again, being true to the writing, you know, honoring those words. So I, I wonder, Tanya, we'll start with you. You know, how much do you actually interact with authors on a regular basis? Or are you just, you know, trusting what they've put on the page? Um, I don't tend to interact with most authors. But some of that is, I mean, there's, so, there's a lot of reasons for it. Um, one of the reasons is sometimes for people that we are working for, that's one of their rules. Um, they have a lot of control on who contacts the author. So unless you really need to, or there's specific information, um, we're kind of not allowed to. Um, I have uh, some social media and have developed friendships and working relationships with a lot of authors, but they know me well enough now that they just kind of trust me uh, to do it. And I look at the script as um, there's no way I'm going to sound like what the author envisions. There's no way. What I can do is bring an interpretation to it, bring a performance to it. And that tends to be my perspective and why I'm not reaching out to authors for a lot of guidance. So we, we've heard a lot about uh, different types of mysteries here. We've talked about because we've talked about humor and we've talked about diverse perspectives. And frankly, there was a question in the Q&A box that was asking, do you mostly narrate, you know, Latino and Latina characters or are they a small portion of what you do? Because you do have to read all the parts. Um, I think, I don't think that it's uh, mostly, I definitely, I think probably do like a 65, 35 kind of split um, on things that are Latino, Latina or not. Maybe it's closer to 50, 50, I don't know. But um, I definitely, I'm so sorry, I have a wolf. Um, I have two dogs, it's just a disaster. Um, I do definitely do a lot of Latin um, inspired work and I love being able to do that. But I think it's a pretty, medium split um i think it's pretty half and half um yeah especially i just i love getting to do it because it's not a world i grew up reading a ton and it's not something especially in the ya world it's not something i ever saw it didn't exist so it's fun to be able to be part of that now and can it, i jump it, can i jump yeah, please oh. yeah Oh, well, something that I've noticed over my, um, I've been uh, narrating now for 20 years, not nonstop, I took some breaks. Um, and one thing that I've noticed, it's not just diversity in voices and mystery, but all across mm -hmm. publishing. Yes. Um, when I first started, most of the books I narrated were for women and all of the main character women that I played were 26 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, that has really changed. Um, uh, the summer I got to record Tess Gerritsen, I think it's Lie to Me, and one of the main characters was uh, one of the detective's mothers who was in her 60s. And it was so fun to play uh, a main character who was not 26 and beautiful um, and who had some life and some grit to her. And in the book that I read the excerpt from here, from Dreamscape, um, there is a love triangle that happens in the book between um, the main character and then there's a man she's interested in and then there's also a woman she's interested in and what was so wonderful about that is that she wasn't conflicted it's just who she is um, she had affection for both of these people and the book didn't focus on that as um as a part of the plot it's just part of the world and i'm noticing that across books mm -hmm. that we're getting more voices the world is getting bigger more stories and it's so much fun 
Well, that was my next question. Are you, you know, seeing this change in publishing that certainly we're reading about publishers trying to have more uh, diverse voices in terms of gender, race, uh, and things like, you know, economic background. Are you feeling that as you read on a day-to-day -day basis? Everyone's sort of nodding. So Pete, we'll start yeah. with you. Ah! <laughs> uh, well, actually to pick up on, on something that Tanya uh, had mentioned about that not being like the real focus, the relationship uh, not being the real focus of the, of the book that they, it, that, it was there, but it wasn't this huge, huge thing. Um, Devil's Chew Toy, um, and there are a lot of, you know, what are called cozy uh, mysteries, queer th queer themed cozy mysteries. I've, see I've been seeing a lot of those lately. And the one of the things I like about Devil's Chew Toy is that the main character is gay. The Many of the uh, side characters are gay as well, but it could so easily not be. Um, and the, it's just the the story itself. I mean, I like stories where that is the focus, but but I also like that it's just like, yeah, well, he happens to be gay. And the rest of the story is just this story that could be, it could be anybody, it could be anybody. Um, uh, I can tell you also that something that I am uh, trying to do as a producer here at Dreamscape is uh i noticed that and i've i've as a producer i've spoken with some authors and presented ideas of hey i know you're a white guy and i have a feeling <laughs> that this character that you wrote this main character i have a feeling you had in mind this is a white guy how would you feel if it wasn't, you know, if it's not mentioned in the text, mm -hmm. if the color of his skin or whatever isn't mentioned, how would you feel about going in a different direction? And more and more authors that I've been talking to are completely willing to do that. You know, just when I toss you options for who might narrate this. Um, and that is something that I'd like to see more of. Um, but I think there is this, and I was guilty of it, you know, there's this assumption that just because this person, just because the author is a white guy or a white woman or a black guy or a black woman, you know, that that it doesn't mean that that main character is necessarily this thing. It's like, I like the idea of exploding that open and, you know, growing our options. What do you think, Janina? Are you seeing more options open up, and are you, you know, seeing more diverse books come your way? In um, <clears throat> I, I would, I guess, I'm going to say yes. Um, what you were just saying, Pete, made me think of I uh, title I recently did um, was called The Inheritors. Uh, it's um, by a white author uh, about she lived in South Africa for a num for at least ten years, a long time, and through the change in leadership from apartheid through now. And it's a fascinating book. Um, I like to say I do books for, by, and about Black people, which basically covers everything. It might be, author might be Black, or the main character might be Black, or the topic might be Black. But in this case, um, the author was white, but the topic is, I mean, there's, uh, these are real people, it's nonfiction, but um, some of the primary characters are, are not Black. So, um, but it came to me. So, um, so it, in this expansive view that, that you're talking about, Pete, it made sense to, I mean, I think if we were just doing, oh, white author, therefore must be white uh, or white female uh, narrator, that would not have come to me. But but again, in terms of topic, it made sense, but it could have mm -hmm. gone either way. It, it was a great book. I'm really grateful that I, I got it, that they asked me to do it. Um, I wanted to mention something else to responding. This isn't completely disconnected from that, but something Tanya was saying about authors and working with them. Um, it's interesting to me also that, um, you know, authors now know that, hey, there's this whole audiobook world and are wanting more input. Um, again, we we are limited sometimes in in by by contract and by particular publishers' preferences in terms of that relationship. And I've had authors who very much wanted to interact with me and and be in a in 
from my perspective as a narrator, very dictatorial about, I want to hear this voice, which there's an author I actually decided to pull away from that series, even though I want to know what happens next, because it's just, there was just too much of her presence to let me do my job. And I think about it, I've started thinking about, I come from theater and mainly tech and backstage, but theater. And I was thinking about, you know, most playwrights, most playwrights do not, they might be at rehearsals, they might have something to say, but they're not, they don't dictate the the theater because it's a different thing. And so I think the writing world, the write, writers, and I am a writer, are may, I hope, are learning that, wait a minute, when this comes from the page and it becomes an oral thing, that's a different medium. And I need to let it not, it's not even about the narrator. I need to let it become what it is. And as mm-hmm. someone who worked in theater for years, the, the, the play that was written on the page and when it become, goes before an audience, those are two different experiences. And so I think that's something that authors, I hope, are learning too. And so mm-hmm. it's really hard for a writer to let go of their, their baby, but in order for that thing to be the fullest oral experience it can be, their needs, they need to let, they need to, they need to leave me alone and me do my job, <laughs> but they need to let it be that oral experience. So I, I just want to throw that out there. No, I think that's an excellent point. And it is interesting to hear about, you know, what happens when an author is involved, that can be a really positive thing, or it can be a, a negative thing. So it, it's interesting to hear those different perspectives from uh, your everyday job, which seems so foreign to those of us who can barely, you know, read a bio. So <laughs> um, one question that we had is, you know, do you all listen to other people narrate and are you affected by that does it influence you in any way we'll start with you frankie um yeah i try to when i can i actually really love listening to memoirs i'm very guilty of like i love like brian cranston tell me about your life i just want to die inside of it cocoon me um i love that but um I love listening to all to my fellow narrators. I've learned a lot, um, especially when I first started from listening to narrators. Um, And I think it's fun to listen to how people have their own kind of style and not only take for that from that, but also give myself the kind of permission to follow my instincts and to like lean into my choices. Um, So yeah, I mean, I love audiobooks. I think they're great. <laughs> I live in LA. I spend a lot of time in a car. So. <laughs> well, there you go. I, yes, I, I I listened to I think three hundred audiobooks in three years in LA from yeah all that driving <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, P, you you are coming from both perspectives because you are listening as a producer and you are narrating. You know what sort of does it give you pause when you get to your own work and. Or does it, you know, enhance it in a way that's helpful? Oh, huh. it would. I would find it intimidating. I think to yeah. listen to a bunch of other people. <laughs> I think that was the case earlier on, and until I really realized that we that it's important that our our individual voices get out there and get into the work and and to realize that you are enough and i think that's when you find really your own style and your your real but i mean if i listen to some of my earlier stuff now mm-mm. but <laughs> but the later stuff it's like yeah there's the nuance and there's the there's that's me you know that's that's yeah. me actually telling that story and But uh, again, early on when I started uh, engineering sessions and directing for Dreamscape, uh, that I think really helped me realize how far people could go Mm -hmm. with character voices in particular. I I always felt like if if I go too far with this character voice, it's not going to feel grounded. in reality and and i i want them to be grounded in reality um and and it gave me the freedom to to really explore more voices and and screw the guy who said 
that my stub in Moby Dick sounded like a cartoon weasel. Oh, maybe he was a cartoon weasel. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. I loved stub. Anyway, I so yeah, uh, uh, I I think that it has helped. I I will say that because I listen to so much at work, um, I I. David Sedaris can't get enough of him. Love, love. Uh, uh, Sarah Vowell, lover. And there are certain people I will listen to entire books from, but I really, I mean, part of the reason that I like to narrate is that I really like to, I don't absorb books as well. Um, and in, you know, in, in, in this similar way by hearing it as I do by reading it, especially off of like a physical page. That's just... I, I'm in love with that. And uh but I but I, I I love audiobooks. I do, otherwise I wouldn't be in the business. But but there is something about reading it that that sinks in for me better. Yeah. Then you are not an oral learner like me. See, I, I need to hear it. See that there's right. all different types right. here. Right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Could I could I jump in real quick because I really want to answer this. Yeah. Um, I'm listening all the time right now. I'm listening to The Good Girl by Mary Kubica with a full cast and The Hour of the Witch by Chris Bohajalian. That's not how you say his name. Bajalian. Um, yeah. Bajalian. Thank you. Um, and one thing that I learned as a performer that really blew my mind was that um, vocalizations are not just pitch, but also pacing. Mm -hmm. So you can have someone who speaks slowly. Mm -hmm. And that gives you a different character feel than for someone who talks really fast and it's the same exact pitch. So mm -hmm. love audiobooks. Well, and, you know, someone had asked, you know, how do you do that? How do you switch on a dime to like a, a male voice? And so, you know, it's not just the pitch, then it's the pace, it's the tone. Like, there's a lot mm -hmm. going on. And it's, it's always funny. People always think it's really exciting to watch an audiobook being narrated, right? <laughs> But you guys make these wonderful tiny little shifts in stance that you barely notice. Mm -hmm. It's, I have to say, you're rather boring to watch, but <laughs> you're great to listen to. <laughs> All right, one final question for Tanya. Um, I hear you have a collaboration on a rom com series with Serena Brown. Is how's Bowen, that coming? Yes. Oh, so, oh, all right. Yes. Well. Right. Yeah, we wrote four books and um, one of them hit the USA Today bestsellers list and it was awesome. And now I have written uh, a memoir on my own and I have an agent now and she's going to be shopping that around soon. And I have a thriller that I'm working on. So thank you for that question. You've picked up some <laughs> great tips from our mystery, you know, webinar Absolutely. Today. Yes. Did you see me taking notes? <laughs> I did not, no. Mostly we've seen cats and dogs and uh, all the important <laughs> parts of the Zoom experience. Well, I want to thank each of you for, you know, bringing your diverse perspectives to this talk and to, you know, helping us open up to the idea that mysteries have diverse voices coming in in different ways and that we're seeing that in publishing. So congratulations to all the authors out there who are doing things like listening to Pete Cross and, you know, yeah. how they should think mm. about their characters. Uh, and thank you to, of course, the Audiophile staff for helping us bring this all together and to Dreamscape for sponsoring this. This will be up on Audiophile's YouTube channel in about a week. And I'd like to say to everyone, have a fantastic start to the school year and have a great afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you.